I'm Dr. Catherine Miller. I'm an assistant professor of international relations in the international relations department at the London School of Economics, and I specialize in gender and international politics. Hi, my name is Martin Bailey. I'm an assistant professor in international relations at the London School of Economics, and I work on historical international relations, empire and South Asia. So my research is broadly involved with the study of death and destruction and how we might think about that differently. So in a more theoretical sense, what I do is I look at the ways in which different forms of social relations and social order relate to violence and how violence in turn informs social relations and social order. And I have a specific interest in social relations and orders relating to gender, sexuality, race, class, ability, and so forth. And so one of my current projects, the book manuscript that I'm currently working on, is looking at the politics of supporting the troops in the United States and the United Kingdom during the early years of what is often referred to as the global war on terror. And I'm interested in the ways in which moral and ethical understandings of citizenship are informed by moral and ethical understandings of masculinity. So what it means to be a good man, what a good man, what a good citizen, what a good person should do in wartime and how that informs affective, so like emotional and political relations that civilians and society have towards the armed forces in wartime. And I'm taking a pretty critical look at the ways in which these forms of support and solidarity as they get entangled with gender norms about manliness, masculinity, what it means to be a good person in wartime, uh, can have inadvertent effects in terms of what that means for viable democratic debate and dissent, again, in the context of war. So I'm interested in empire and how it operates or operated as a political form uh, and how that varied across time and space. I'm particularly interested in what we might call frontier spaces. So those spaces on the peripheries of imperial rule. And the reason for this, I think, is that empire or the way we think about empire within international relations uh, is often challenged when we look at these frontier areas. They were often sites of territorial ambiguity and of sovereign ambiguity. Uh, they often exhibited various forms of governing practices and contestation over those practices. And they also generated a, a vast amount of knowledge uh, that tells us something about the worldview of empires. So if we look at the space nowadays occupied by Pakistan and Afghanistan, which is an area that I've looked at in my past research, historically, this was seen by the British Empire as a site of danger or of uncertainty and also um, an area of risk. So frontier spaces change the way that we think about empire as a powerful entity. Instead, we see empire as a, a very um, unstable and in some ways anxious entity, and one that was um, only ever uh, slightly in grasp of what it was doing on the ground, if you like. More recently, my research has taken a, a new direction. I'm interested in how this knowledge that was generated by those colonized by empire uh, was reacted to. So how did those subjects to imperial rule um, generate their own knowledge or react against imperial knowledge forms? And this is important because it allows us to think about how world orders were not simply um, based on European or imperial forms of knowledge, but were contested across, across different spaces. I've spent some time looking at Indian uh, or South Asian based scholars, organizations and activists and how they reacted against imperial forms of knowledge and conjured up their own understandings of world order and how world order uh, should change. So in terms of the impact I see or hope to see coming out of my broad academic research, there's at least sort of two audiences or two lanes. The first, in terms of thinking really critically about the military and civil military relations and how gender relations and norms relate to what we think of as a good citizen and citizenship duties, 
I hope to, to help us to think more critically in a fairly broad sense about the role of the military and aggressive foreign policy in democratic societies. And this involves working with non-governmental organizations, can involve working with students, with my own students, but students also at the secondary school level, and also with politicians who are engaged in processes of democratic oversight relating to the armed forces. The second uh, sort of branch of my impact and outreach activities actually relates much more directly to the armed forces themselves. Under sort of the ambit of my broader expertise in gender relations and the armed forces, as well as more and more generally, I also work directly with armed forces. I do that in two ways. One is to come in as an outside academic lecturer, often to uh, officer training courses to discuss academic theories and understandings of how gender roles and relations relate to conflict, the ways in which military operations play out, and how they sort of inform what we tend to think of as normal and natural in military settings. So helping the military itself actually think more critically about what it does. The second track within that is that I also work as what's sometimes referred to as a gender trainer, which is a funny term, for people in the armed forces to go in and help them think in a very practical and applied way about how gender and gendered inequality relates to their day-to-day -day lives and their day-to-day -day activities as members of the military. That's both within terms of thinking about promoting gender equality, inclusivity, and belonging within their own armed forces, right? And thinking about reducing dynamics that could be exclusionary in terms of gender, race, sexuality, and so forth. And it's also about thinking through gendered needs, vulnerabilities, and capabilities of people members of the armed forces might encounter in a conflict zone upon deployment, or on a peacekeeping mission and helping them think through the practical skills as well as their legal and sort of operational obligations to think through how they might protect and also reduce harm to men, boys, women, girls, and non-binary people in the context of ongoing conflict or a peacekeeping setting. So my research will be relevant to those interested in the history of world politics more broadly, and particularly uh, those interested in histories uh, of international order from beyond Europe. Uh, in the past, my work on frontiers and on Afghanistan and on knowledge formations has been useful for uh, those organisations, including foreign ministries and uh, military organisations, who are seeking to understand various parts of the world. Uh, something I contribute here is thinking about how knowledge is ordered and systematized and how that is in fact shaping the way that they see the world. More recently, my work on uh, non-Western international thought of international thought from India is useful for those who are seeking to understand the lineages of contemporary world order. We live in a world of what are referred to as rising powers, including India. And it's now important that we understand uh, world order from their perspective and the perspectives uh, and the histories of world order thinking. Very often the histories that I'm looking at from the Indian perspective have been hidden or submerged or overlooked. And it's important that we pay closer attention to these histories in order to understand South Asia's current position in world politics today. The theory area history cluster is a theoretically pluralist venue for the inquiry into a variety of theoretical and empirical problems in world politics. And so my research background is more shaped by historical international relations uh, and pointing theory towards questions of how we understand change over time, the change in policies and forms of knowledge. Um, but the cluster provides a forum for having conversations about my own research, as well as the research of others in the department and PhD students, faculty and invited speakers. We're actually not incredibly concerned with nailing down the exact meaning of these words really directly or prescriptively, but instead we're interested in like providing a space in which 
people who have work that falls under this rubric or could fall under this rubric are invited to come and discuss and share. The cluster reflects where the discipline of international relations is today in the sense that it's not so shaped by the idea of theory as kind of different traditions or, or isms, for example. And in fact, maybe the discipline has never been that way. We tend to think eclectically about theory, uh, that theory comes from many different sources. And when you look at theory within the tradition, actually we see a kind of a confluence of, or an assemblage of many different ways of thinking about the world that come from many different thinkers. And so I guess we think across theory broadly conceived. In a sense, everyone in international relations, the discipline is doing theory of some kind. Uh, and I guess the cluster is there to sort of really inquire into the multiple ways that we might theorize the world. The cluster provides a space for people with ostensibly different research interests and skills to come together to discuss things and to work together, right? So I'm thinking now, for instance, um, you and I, along with our colleague, Dr. Yuna Han and two PhD students, Katarina Kuhn and Irina Morlino, just finished a collaborative project looking at the politics of, unfortunately, death and grief and social order in relation to the sort of emergent COVID-19 crisis. Because one of the things we also do is try to use theory to help us think about really pressing social and political problems. That's right. And, and the forum, the cluster provides a great venue for that kind of research, because that was a project that involved a variety of kind of theoretical uh, influences. So there were sort of ideas taken from transitional justice, as well as more of your kind of work on social scripts and, and grief. Um, and then from my perspective, being able to contribute historical case study uh, uh, empirics on the Spanish flu pandemic, the so-called Spanish flu pandemic in the UK in 1918-19, in order to show how theory can be used to historical cases or applied to historical cases to show the kind of enduring logics and social logics of pandemics. Interestingly, how those social logics are forgotten and not memorialized, which I think is quite important, one of the quite important findings from the project. Yeah, definitely. And I think the, the project really illustrates sort of the benefit of bringing in sort of eclectic theoretical approaches and ideas that don't immediately seem to go together. Because they provide, I think, like a much more nuanced and sophisticated lens on like mass death in the complex context of COVID-19 is a really difficult and complex problem to understand and to talk about. And I think it gave us just a much better sense of both from your research on the project, historical lessons learned, and from you know my research and Dr. Han's research, things we should be nervous about or looking to do going forward to help produce sort of solidaristic and inclusive COVID-19 recovery and commemoration. Which definitely, and so, and in that way, this sort of theoretical innovation fed into, in ways I hope are productive, into policy briefs and reports that we wrote moving forward for politicians, policymakers, people working in the, the non governmental sector, as well as this project that LSE Libraries did that it was such a privilege for us to be involved in aimed at primary school children and helping them to think about working with grief and loss either um, in their own lives or the lives of their friends and families in the context of COVID, which, I mean, it's tragic that that's necessary, but it's amazing to be able to help support that type of publicly oriented and socially impactful work. <laughs>